there's fast, and then there's faster. Pep Voice is upgrading your auto service and tire experience to go further, faster. With a team of ASE certified techs you can trust. New and modern store designs to keep you comfy and connected. Text alerts to track your vehicle's progress. Quick and easy mobile payments. And 1,000 convenient locations ready to serve you. So you can get in, get out, and get back on the road. Make an appointment today at PepBoys.com. We go further to help you go farther. It's Monday. It's July 18th. And the word of the day is empalomania, meaning the manic desire to hold public office no matter what. Using a sentence, looking at the contenders for the next Prime Minister of the UK, empalomania seems to be more <laughs> contagious than COVID. Mm. Or chicken pox. <laughs> I mean, at this point, who catches COVID and who's Prime Minister of the UK seem equally preventable. Yeah, so. true, true. Oh, and you can offset the negative effects with a jab in both instances, too. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Michael Marshall, and broadcasting medically delayed from America's <laughs> far center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Marsh keeps us up to date on the death of the Empire. We'll check in on a mansion more haunted than Luigi's. And Eli won't let me leave America until he fully understands how prime ministers are chosen. You're never going home. <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, of all the embarrassing facts that you know about Heath, which one would he least like you to share with the listeners? Ooh, okay. How about all of his puns and his wordplay are actually ghostwritten by Eli? That's true. That's true. (laughs) And see, I was just going to point out that he's really bad at code names and that he lost every single match we played. That is also true. I won every match that we played. Um, I I only played two, but like... uh, Bad in a thousand. In our lead story tonight, Boris Johnson receives a job blow. Nice. <laughs> so the the chaotic three year reign of Prime Minister Boris Johnson came to an underwhelming climax last week amid a series of sex scandals and ministerial resignations. The final straw came after the chief whip Chris Pincher stepped down from his role for what he described as quote being incredibly drunk and quote embarrassing himself, which actually turned out to be sex crime talk for having carried out a series of sexual assaults. Yeah, dude, you are an insult to embarrassing yourself by being incredibly drunk. <laughs> <laughs> the weirdest thing about this, from the, from the American perspective at least, has been the way that we've jealously looked on from overseas thinking, remember when there were a level of scandals where they would resign because oh, of them? Right, yeah. Well, as bad as it is that all of this happened, worse still was the fact that this is far from the first time he's been doing this. And it eventually emerged after really a lot of avoidance of the issue that Boris was fully aware of the previous serious allegations before he appointed Pincher to the position of power and authority that he subsequently went on to abuse. Boris was aware of this at the time. Well, you know what they say, like hires like... Right, exactly, exactly. Because the thing is, Borjo has been under increasing fire for some time, and he, he suffered two resounding special election defeats just back in June, both of which were also related to sex scandals involving members of his party. Because one was brought about after a Tory MP, Neil Parrish, was forced to resign his seat after he was caught watching porn in Parliament. You might remember that story. And then another Tory MP, Imran Khan, had to be replaced after he was imprisoned for sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy. I like that Neil was like, well, if watching porn at work is a crime, oh, it is. Well, I guess I don't need a second half of that sentence, then I guess I'll just be leaving. Okay, wait, so... I, like. I'm working now. I've been jerking off to the site of Boris Johnson's implosion. Does this count? Can I get can I be forced to resign for this? It's, it's crazy. There are currently 56 members of parliament who are currently accused of sexual misconduct. Jesus. 56. The majority of them are from Boris's party, including Boris himself. Because Boris has been repeatedly accused of things like groping journalists, grabbing someone's thigh under a table, stuff like that. And then on top of all of that, it actually emerged in the last couple of weeks that while Boris was still foreign secretary, he tried to appoint the woman who's now his wife, Carrie Johnson, to a high powered and highly paid position back when she was just a member of his staff. 
And he was only prevented from doing that when one of his colleagues walked in on her giving him oral sex in his office. Jesus. At the time when his wife at the time was undergoing cancer treatment, Boris managed to do the he managed to achieve the almost impossible. The Clinton Gingrich is what Boris achieved. Oh, uh, well, you had to call it that. Now I have to come up with a new name for my orgasms, Marsh. Fine. <laughs> And, and just to point out, it's it's actually really tricky to be on this show and to argue that you should really be taking British politics very seriously when we're talking about Prime Minister BJ getting a BJ <laughs> and a serial groper whose name is Mr. Pincher. Like, I swear my country is not a carry-on film. I promise I, you it I, isn't. Your, your disgraced sex feed PM is named Johnson and has pube hair. I don't know that I believe you, Marsh. Fair. Fair. <laughs> yeah, uh, for the Americans in the audience, Carry On was a 31 film series equivalent of raising your eyebrows when a hot girl walks by. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, you're missing the crucial element of the swanny whistle. <laughs> yeah. That was a, a crucial part of the film, too. <laughs> Um, So all of this kicked off a series of events just last week that were dizzying to be watching from the other side of the Atlantic, which is where I was at the time. I was sat in MoMA when Chancellor Rishi Sunak and the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, resigned from the government, citing Boris's incompetence. Those are essentially the second and fourth most important roles in the government went at the same time. Wow. And... It all got very crazy very quickly because very quickly Boris had to move someone into the Chancellor position. So he moved the Education Secretary, which is uh, Nadim Zahawi. They moved him to Chancellor, despite the fact that Zahawi's own tax affairs have been under investigation by the National Crime Agency (laughs) for his tax avoidance schemes when he used to own a a polling company called YouGov. And as soon as, literally as soon as Zahawi was appointed to the role by Johnson, he immediately called for Boris Johnson to resign, like minutes after <laughs> being in the role. I, I just have to say, as someone who was like in the vicinity, this was very confusing news to stand near. Right, <laughs> I was at the MoMA. Marsh kept saying that Chimingham had left the House of Lords, and I didn't know if he was talking about a painting he was looking at or something in the news. So okay, so I feel like that promotion was mostly prompted by like you know nipping this aptronym problem in the bud. Like it's hard to pluck <laughs> fuck puns out of the name Zahawi, right? That is true. <laughs> Give us time, we'll get there. The, the great thing is Zahawi, Zahawi then had to be replaced as education secretary so boris johnson moved someone called michelle donnellan into the role no one has ever heard of michelle donnellan um the only reason we've heard of her is because once she was in the role she immediately resigned calling for boris johnson to resign it was her second day of the job as educational secretary so boris johnson had to appoint a third education secretary in the space of three days which is ironic for a man who has never learned a lesson in his life yeah i mean to be fair here in america at one point we went through press secretaries so fast we stopped laminating the badges but i get it i feel your pain right yeah call us when your education secretary start warning about bears in your schools <laughs> and all of this culminated in boris finally announcing his intention to resign as prime minister though people pointed out in his resignation speech he didn't actually say he was resigning he only announced his intention to resign not announcing his resignation itself in his speech he, he blamed everybody else he showed zero signs of remorse or introspection And then he just went back into his office to carry on working, opening up the the very real possibility that his plan was to just Costanza it and keep turning up to work (laughs) after after he resigned. And the days following the speech saw even more scandals about Johnson come out, about how he met with uh, Alexander Lebedev, the son of a KGB agent and oligarch, um, and he met with him without any security staff present at the time, which was described as a major security risk. Uh, There was another scandal came out about how he tried to secure yet another well-paid position for yet another member of staff he was having yet another affair with. And for a while, we were just getting daily scandals about Boris Johnson, and it felt a bit like... uh, Um, There'd just be a new scandal in the newspapers every single day until he resigned, like some sort of indeterminate advent calendar of sleaze, where where Christmas was the day we'd all finally get to see the back of Boris Johnson. Okay, Marsha's Christmas list is a weird one. Right, seeing the back of someone means him him leaving, him going. Uh, Okay, withdrawn. Withdrawn. Yeah, makes way more sense now. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So, with Boris Johnson officially stepping down, we'll soon get to look forward to another brighter, Boris-free future with some other Tory in charge. But we'll have more on that later. And if an antithesis is allowed to be a segue, it's time to go from Boris Johnson to policy genius. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, I'm Michael Marshall. You know, if this week of mortal terror has taught me anything, it's that you never know what life has in store. One minute, you're on a lovely vacation. 
The next, your wife is on the no-fly list along with Al-Qaeda and Cat Stevens. That's right, Marsh. And that's why there's Policy Genius. What's Policy Genius? Policy Genius is an insurance comparison website that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in one place to find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. 50%? Why, that's the number of people our travel insurance offered to fly back at any given time. Just head to PolicyGenius.com to get personalized quotes in minutes and find the right policy for your need. The licensed agents at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies. They're on hand through the entire process to help you understand your options so you can make decisions with confidence. Like, for example, should I try to find a flight home from Boston or should I inflict four hours of Eli's driving on my ill spouse? Hey, I hit that baby carriage after I dropped you off. Head to PolicyGenius.com to get your free life insurance quote and see how much you could save. Policy Genius. Because sometimes saying, at least I have insurance, is the only positive thing you can say about your weekend. Didn't look at my phone for four hours. Because we physically had to take it off you. Not the point. <laughs> <laughs> And we're back. Next up in headlines in Dinobots and Obstructicons news, West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin announced on Thursday that he sucks even more than that. Like, <laughs> as hard as you thought he already sucks, he sucks even harder. <laughs> After Democrats rewrote, pared down, and otherwise bastardized their policy goals to fit through Manchin's puckered asshole of acceptability, he clinched <laughs> even harder in an effort to prove that we were never dealing with an intellectually honest person guided by principle, but rather an obstructionist toady guided by campaign donations. Specifically, he communicated on Thursday that he would not support any legislation that increased taxes on the wealthy or contained new spending on clean energy. But if his fellow Senate Democrats promise not to address environmental collapse or income inequality, Manchin pledges to come up with a new list of demands to imperil whatever half ass measure he left open. <laughs> yeah. At this point, if you shot Joe Manchin, you could just say you were a time traveler from the future, and they'd have to believe you. They illegally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. That is ridiculous. We all know completely by this point there isn't going to be a future. That's right. Yeah, yeah that would be the, that'd be the sticking point. <laughs> So in response to Manchin's hissy fit, Biden urged lawmakers to pass whatever they could get that ab obstinate asshole to agree to and then vowed to address climate change with whatever executive action he had at his disposal. In fact, the White House gave up on negotiating with Manchin altogether last winter, leaving that headache for Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Uh, when Joe Biden was asked if he thought Man Manchin was negotiating in good faith, Biden essentially answered pass. <laughs> he said, quote, I didn't negotiate with Joe Manchin. I have no idea, end quote. Right, like, which is like answering the question, do you think Andy Wilson is a cannibal by pointing out that I didn't even dine with him last Wednesday? <laughs> In fairness, I have dined with Andy Wilson, and I'm not sure even I can answer that question. <laughs> also, fun fact, I haven't personally seen Andy Wilson eat human flesh was literally Lawrence Krauss's Epstein pedophile defense. Oh, you're right, it was. <laughs> That's it was. fair. It yep, that was. is fair. Wow. So it, while they haven't said it publicly, a number of key White House officials have made it clear to reporters that they don't think Manchin will sign on to anything ever, period. He has his marching orders from the coal magnates that own his ass, and those orders say don't march under any circumstances. So nobody's particularly surprised that he moved the goalposts yet again. Yeah. I, I, every time I see this, people keep acting like this is the West Wing and Joe Biden can sit Joe Manchin down for a Sworkin-esque monologue to change his mind. <laughs> but that show, like democracy, is pretend, you guys. It's, <laughs> it's a fiction. Well, look. It is really easy to look at this chunk of legislative cholesterol that is Joe Manchin and see him as a symbol of the inevitable failure of the democratic process. The, the fact that one obstructionist douche gargler can completely upend an agenda that the overwhelming majority of the country favors is very obviously a problem with our system. And a lot of people are tempted to use it as an excuse to throw their hands in the air and declare the entire process futile. But if your reaction to Joe Manchin torpedoing Democratic legislation is anything other than, damn, do we need to strengthen the Democratic majority in the Senate, you're doing the math wrong. <laughs> Like, sure, it's great to talk about changing the system and it's a good long-term goal, but gaining one seat in the fucking Senate is way easier than fundamentally reconfiguring our system of government. In fact, for anything other than a goddamn revolutionary war, it would be a prerequisite to fundamentally reconfiguring our system of government. 
Well, I'm glad at least that you're leaving Revolutionary War on the table as an option. That's sensible to leave it. Um, <laughs> well, but can I just ask that you give it at least a week? I really have to get out of your country soon. Yeah, I really it didn't, need to. Didn't work out well for your nationality last time we had one of those. Yeah. So, okay. The, the point, though, is that we gave the Democrats a zero-seat majority in the Senate. So the fact that they've gotten anything at all done is pretty impressive. Imagine what they could do if we bumped that up to one. <laughs> or, or actually, preferably two, because Kirsten Cinema is also shit. Yeah. Fair, fair. Next up in headlines, in Who You Gonna Call News? Psst. Psst. Hey. Hey, kid. You wanted to fund the police? Well... America got one step closer to that this week, as its first three-digit call number for mental health crisis, 988, went live thanks to $400 million in bipartisan funding for the project. That's right, you can dial three numbers in a mental health emergency and maybe not get murdered by the cops now, you lucky so-and-sos. Yeah, the the current system of preventing mental health emergencies by reducing the number of people to have them is a real (laughs) eugenics by cop vibe. (laughs) Yeah. To be fair, our entire national history has a eugenics by cop vibe. (laughs) That's true. That's true. true. That is true. That is true. So right now the number is essentially a shortcut to the U.S. suicide hotline. And I just want to point out, that's great all by itself, right? Not everyone in a mental health crisis has the wherewithal to Google 10 digits of numbers. And even more folks who might need to call might not have ready access to the Internet to look it up in the first place. But as I said, there's a second secret use in 988's future that should get all my fellow ACAB enthusiasts excited. According to the New York Times, quote, while data shows that hotlines can resolve about 80% of crises without further intervention, the vision for 988 is that counselors will eventually be able to connect callers with mobile crisis teams that can come to where they are, as well as short-term mental health care triage centers. Those changes are expected to reduce law enforcement interventions and reliance on emergency rooms, ultimately keeping more people alive end quote okay not, not that i don't appreciate this progress i really do but when more police intervention is the opposite of keeping more people alive you've got problems that can't be solved with a new phone number <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we're trying to stay positive here yeah, no, no, that's <laughs> trying fine. to stay positive okay. and look if you've never been a danger to yourself or lived with someone who has a severe mental illness you could be forgiven for thinking that like This three-digit number isn't a big deal. But boy, oh boy, would you be wrong. What's going to happen if I call the cops is one of the scariest decisions the mentally ill and their families have Mm -hmm. to make on a regular basis. And this phone line is a real alternative to that terror. It's early days, and I've been doing this job long enough to know that you never ever go fully optimistic when it comes to the skeptocrat. But as far as the best news of 2022 goes... This is pretty damn close. So you are right, and this is great news, but now people are going to survive their experience of mental health emergency response long enough to be crushed by the ensuing medical debt. Your country is weird. Has anyone ever told you guys your country's weird? (laughs) How fucked up is it that that joke still works in a segment that led off with Boris Johnson news? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And speaking of folks you can turn to for help with your mental health, let's pause for a minute for our second sponsor this week, BetterHelp Online Therapy. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. You know, that new 988 number is great, but sometimes you need mental health care that isn't an emergency. Sometimes you just need someone to talk through the stresses of everyday life or what's going on in the world with. And that's where talking to a licensed professional therapist can really help. One of the ways that you can do that is with this week's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat-only therapy sessions, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's affordable, financial aid is available, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Plus, they've got a wide variety of expertise available. So if you need someone who's LGBTQ friendly or secular that won't tell you that the solution to all your problems is Jesus, they can help you find that. And if the therapist you're matched with isn't a good fit for you, you can always switch for free with BetterHelp. And don't forget, our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash skeptocrat. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash skeptocrat. And we're back. 
Next up in headlines in the never-ending Tories news, <laughs> for all its many flaws, one of the few things to admire about American democracy is its clockwork punctuality. For example, Eli, when is the next US presidential election? Hats. Mm. Okay. See, this is why I only ever come on this show when Heath's here. This is, this is, <laughs> this is why I put that in my demands. Um, but anyway, while Americans can circle a November date in their diary four years in advance and know that that there is the day that they'll stay home because they want to send a message. <laughs> uh, in the UK, our democracy runs to a timeline more similar to the rate of nuclear decay. You know, our general elections can happen essentially any time often entirely by surprise, and only ever usually once enough Tories think it's about time for a change. Yeah, my wife does haircuts according to the same system, so I get it. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> you know that problem that the Julian calendar was implemented to fix? Yeah, UK hasn't quite sorted that one out yet. Right, no. exactly. And the thing is, they even tried to sort it. They tried to add some structure to our elections. They tried with the, the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which they brought in in 2011, and that put in place five-year terms terms between general elections and it didn't go great because we subsequently had a general election taking place in 2015 then 2017 then 2019 and <laughs> almost certainly one within the next year from now and then the fixed term parliament act was kind of quietly repealed in march despite having never actually been used for the thing it was used for <laughs> or it was, some might say because it was never used. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah, the UK's democracy hasn't quite reached the level of coordination you'd expect from, say, the company's annual summer potluck, but at least they're trying. <laughs> or no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, at least they have tried and given up. <laughs> And, and while general elections could happen at any moment, that's actually not how the UK elects and finds a new prime minister. And before you say, no, we don't just rely on people pulling swords out of stones anymore. <laughs> uh, mostly because if you give a Tory access to a sharp implement, they'll just bury it in one of their colleagues' backs. <laughs> okay. I mean, that seems like a win-win to me, Marsh. Well, no, if I reconsider the mm. stone. <laughs> well, I'd say what you will about farcical aquatic ceremonies, but no strange woman lying in a pond ever gave Boris Johnson a fucking sword. So, I don't know, dial it back, man. Go back <laughs> yeah. to the sword and the stone bit. For what we know about Boris Johnson, it usually works the other way with strange <laughs> women and someone getting a, a sword. Anyway, instead, in the UK, the public, uh, they elect a, a local member of parliament, and whichever party has the most members elected then gets to choose one of those members to lead the country, which means that as soon as enough of them decide that they could do a better job than the current leader or that their party's leader's back is looking awfully unstabbed right now, they can force a resignation and try to become prime minister themselves. And from there, the, the paid-up card-carrying members of just the leading party get to decide which of their MPs will be the new prime minister. I mean, to be fair, Marsh, we kind of do the same thing in the United States, but we added that at the very end, we all yell at each other about which of the two we should choose. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think Americans can really throw stones at a system designed to prevent the torpidity of divided government, especially <laughs> right now. So, so, so that, this is the position the UK finds itself in right now, with just 175,000 people in the entire country who will decide who gets to run the country, who gets to be the prime minister. 175,000 Tory members, that's it. That's all the democracy gets. It's kind of like small batch democracy. You know, it's the craft beer <laughs> of elections in that it's primarily aimed at fairly well-off white men. Those are the only <laughs> people in the target audience. 80% of the people who'll be choosing the next prime minister are from the highest income and social class bracket in the country and more than 90 percent of them are white yeah like i said we have the same yeah. system <laughs> okay fair fair so the new prime minister will have a lot of fires to put out quite possibly literally if the uk's 100 100 degree fahrenheit heat wave continues um just this week the uk announced 200,000 covid deaths as a total so far and that one in every 19 people in the country currently right now have covid I had to update that since I wrote this script. It was one in 20 when I first wrote it. It's now one in 19 people in my country currently have COVID right now. And then we've got this cost of living crisis that's seeing people pay around £3,000 per year on household utility bills. And petrol just hit £2 per litre in some places. Sorry, uh, gas just hit <laughs> what, $8.96 per gallon in some liters. God, I need to get out of this country. Okay. <laughs> Do you, Marsh? Because at those prices, you might have to take out a mortgage on your Uber home from the airport. Uh, yeah, though. that's true. <laughs> so nice of the environment to give all them COVID patients a head start on their fever, though. Right? <laughs> 
And so the rate of inflation in the UK right now is at 9%, meaning that it's risen faster than Wikipedia's estimate for the number of Boris Johnson's children. <laughs> um, and so all of the leadership candidates who are trying to become the next Tory leader, and there's quite a lot of those, they've all spent their entire campaigns focusing on the things that really matter to the country, like where trans people should pee. That is that is literally what they've been for. In fact, in the leadership debate that was broadcast on national television, there was a whole section dedicated to what is a woman. And nobody, nobody on the stage answered, well, whatever one is, there's around 100,000 fewer of them to worry about thanks to the way this government handled COVID. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> hey, have any of them tried blaming Joe Biden for the petrol prices? <laughs> it works wonders for our conservatives, and it makes exactly as much sense in your country as ours. So it it does, that is true. Uh, and meanwhile, we've seen pretty much all of the candidates say they're going to abandon our climate change commitments. They say they're going to cut taxes, increase spending, and decrease debt. Um, and then they're also going to carry on the racist uh, policy of deporting any refugees that come to the country to Rwanda. That is currently their plan that we're currently doing, deporting them to Rwanda. That is the land that I'll soon be returning to, you know, steeped in self-denial, pulling itself apart for the approval of a minority of super rich white men. Um, how long do I have to stay in my hotel before they give me a green card to your country? Just in, in your related news. I'm on it, Marsh. Do you know if your wife has ever had the swine flu? The swine flu. <laughs> She's willing to give it a try. She absolutely is. <laughs> And in fool's Russian news, but like the nationality, it works when it's written. You have to see it written. Russian forces are using nuclear power plants as weapon depots so that they're less likely to be targeted by Ukrainian bombers. Because what possible <laughs> negative outcome could happen from storing high explosives up to and including missile systems in nuclear power plants? At the same time, Putin has signed an order dramatically expanding the definition of foreign agent in Russian law to include anyone the state deems to have, quote, fallen under a foreign influence, end quote. Uh, this expansion includes any group that receives any funding whatsoever from a foreign source, as well any, as any group that receives non-financial support from abroad. So, like... I, I don't like retweets. <laughs> if if that's the case, can we fuck with him by sending Putin a good look card so he's got to then <laughs> deem himself a foreign agent? <laughs> oh right, yeah, no, but but don't worry. There's a bright side. There's a silver lining to this dark cloud because as all that was happening, Russia and the U.S. have finally hammered out their cosmic carpooling situation. Uh, we learned on Friday that after months of intense negotiation, NASA and Russia's counterpart Roscosmos have agreed to a ride-sharing agreement that would allow both countries a knots to fly in one another's spaceships and use the HOV lane while so doing. Okay, fine, we carpool, but you need to be waiting outside when we come to pick you up. It's rude to make me wait outside like a Lyft driver. <laughs> I don't like that. Just right, be outside. Yeah. So, now, obviously, this seems a bit superfluous at a time when Russia's collecting war crimes like they were fucking Pokemon, but it's worth noting that space exploration is basically the one last place where the U.S. and Russia still cooperate peacefully. Right, so this does kind of matter. Uh, but for years, the agencies have been operating without any formal agreement with regards to how their people will get back and forth to the jointly owned International Space Station. It is so weird that this whole thing was just working on the honor system. Yeah. Like there was some kind of take an astronaut, leave an astronaut jar there. <laughs> <laughs> and look, and that had real world consequences, especially when the former head of Roscosmos, Dmitry Rogozin, threatened to strand U.S. astronauts on the damn thing in retaliation for the U.S. opposition to their war in Ukraine. OK, but there is nothing more emblematic of Russian foreign policy than threatening to starve people to death on your last remaining form of international cooperation. No, that's true. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and by the way, the whole former part of former head of Roscosmos, uh, something of a new addition to his job title, he was actually replaced in the position by one Yuri Borisov approximately 15 minutes before this carpooling agreement was announced. Uh, now, the Russian government hasn't given any particular reason for ousting Rigozin, but it was almost certainly a condition of the agreement, right? Because Rogozin was a psychotic warmonger. He served just under four years as the head of Russia's space agency, and his tenure will mostly be remembered for all the nuclear wars he tried to pick on Twitter. So in charge for four years, and then he spent that time trying to provoke nuclear <laughs> wars on Twitter. Has he tried? Has Rogozin tried claiming he's still the head of Roscosmos? He could get his followers <laughs> to like storm the ISS or something. <laughs> right? No, good point. Jump, comrade! Jump. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
<laughs> now, if, if you're a space news junkie like myself, you've been terrified of Rogozin for a while. After the U.S. hit Roscosmos with sanctions in retaliation for the Ukrainian invasion, Rogozin threatened to strand U.S. astronauts on the ISS, threatened to pull out of the joint project altogether, and then like vaguely alluded to how easy it would be to sabotage the thing. And then at the same time, he also sent out a series of tweets boasting of Russia's nuclear capabilities that were occasionally accompanied by coordinates and satellite photos of Western defense sites. Yikes. Oh, that's not great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so as of this recording, there's no official indication of where Rogozin is going to land, uh, which is not at all unusual under Putin. Uh, one semi-independent Russian media outlet said he would be promoted and put in charge of occupied territories in Ukraine – which ex- seems like the exact kind of trolly bullshit Putin would do if Rogozin's ouster was a condition forced on him by the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, and given Putin's disposition, it's entirely possible that this Borisov guy is going to like tweet out pictures of him riding a nuclear bomb like Slim Pickens in Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> but his administration started with a whiff of cooperation, which puts him way ahead of Rogozin's lifetime total. So we- at least we've got that to cling to. <laughs> and finally tonight, in Dr. Oz's New Jersey News... I'll admit, it's not a lot of fun following along with the midterms this year. Between the maybe we'll do something if you give us $15 emails and the Trump back judge dread bad guys doing way better in backwater bullshit parts of the country than they should, it can be hard to see the funny side. But one place where that is not the case is in the swing state of Pennsylvania, where senatorial candidate John Fetterman is doing a truly masterful job of irritating his opponent, Dr. Mehmet Oz, for, of all things, residing in the beautiful state of New Jersey, where everyone on this podcast just had a lovely vacation. We mostly just went to New York, though. My wife literally caught a pox. Anyways. <laughs> so for those of you unfamiliar with Dr. Mehmet Oz, like so many things Oprah introduced to the world, he's the fucking worst. And he's also a fraud. He's a fraudulent fraud that commits fraud. Marsh, you want to get in on this? You're on an American show in America this time. Right. But I do plan to get back into England eventually. You do know mm-hmm. that. That's not what your airline told me. <laughs> yeah, no, you'd be amazed at the number of diseases Eli has lined up for your wife to prevent that, Marsh. <laughs> <laughs> BFFs. Anyways, one of the fraudy fraud fraudnik ways in which he's a fraud is that he's running for a Pennsylvania Senate seat in spite of very obviously living in New Jersey. And that was hilariously pointed out again this week as Fetterman's campaign paid just under $400 for Snooky from the Jersey Shorecast to send him a very special shout out asking him why anyone would want to leave Jersey for work. And in fairness, in the outtakes from that clip, she also had to ask, what's work? What What is work? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and, and also, by the way, there's a 50-50 chance Herschel Walker is asking a reporter if fish can vote as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I just want to point out that I have the advantage on hometown Senate farce stuff for this new cycle. Thank That's you very true. much. That is true. I seed the ground, sir. Either way, the race, and this is really important, is incredibly close right now. Like, pretty much all the important races for the upcoming midterms. So if you're in, and I, I can't say this enough, any state in the United States, and you'd like this show to remain free of a how to make improvised weapons segment, <laughs> vote like your life depends on it. <sighs> and on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to Michael Marshall. Thanks to Eli Bostic. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us feedback on all the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening. Please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at Patreon.com. Com slash skeptocrat. Just like Susan James J. Siegman, Caleb Atheism is Couch, Cheese Vote Blue 2022. It's not incest porn. It's Laura, David, help. All the frogs have been turned gay, and now I can't date any stray frogs anymore. Joe, Rachel, Doom, and HMP, whose selfies deserve the same kind of ceremonious reveal we gave to the James Webb picks. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available where all the podcasts live. And we just have one last thing let's compliment that pianist special thanks to ryan slotnick of evil giraffes on mars he's the creator of the virtuosic music stylings that you heard today which were used with his permission you should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by googling the only band called evil giraffes on mars until next time catchphrase sign off
Um, all right, so we'll just go ahead and start off with the intro. And Marsh, if you could do this, it's Monday, like super sexy, the way Heath does it. <laughs> give us peak sex. I will give what I can do. Um, all right. <laughs> and you're going to have to find that as arousing as you find it. Yeah, that's that's how I approach sex too, Marsh. So I get it. <laughs> Doing the best I can. <laughs> you work with that. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. Now through July 20th, join Planet Fitness for $1 down, $10 a month. And feel spectacular in the judgment-free zone with the most energy you've had since... Kindergarten when we had daily naps? Exactly. And in our clean and spacious clubs with tons of equipment, you'll feel confident. Like after... I've carried in all the groceries in one trip? More like, wait, that's exactly what it feels like. Join at planetfitness.com or in club. $1 down, $10 a month. Cancel anytime. Hurry. Deal ends July 20th. See club for details.